Hello, everyone. My name is Kadeen Bennett. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm the ACLU of Illinois Advocacy and Intergovernmental Affairs Director. So welcome to our virtual town hall. Our the title for our virtual town hall is Privacy and Civil Liberties in a Time of Great Change. It both feels spot on and it also feels like an understatement when I think about the moment we're in right now. There is so much happening in the area of privacy, technology, and surveillance. But tonight our conversation will focus on privacy and civil liberties issues as they intersect with the ongoing global pandemic that is COVID-19 the ever-increasing use of technology by police and their collaboration with private companies, and the uprising and protest movement in response to the continuing, continued killing of Black folks at the hands of law enforcement. We've received lots of questions in advance of tonight's town hall, and that's really helped shape the discussion today. But don't worry, if you didn't submit questions, you still can. You can put them in the chat during the conversation or email events at aclu-il.org, and we'll try to get to as many of those questions as possible. While we can't see you, we still want to be able to interact with you beyond the questions in the chat. So we will be doing a bit of audience polling th throughout the event. So keep an eye out on your screen. Um, actually, let's see if it works now. So um, let's go to our first poll question, just to get a sense of who's in the audience. So uh, Jay is going to bring up our question, which is, before this town hall, how actively were you thinking about your data privacy rights? So click on your answer. Think about them often. Think about them sometimes. Don't think about them much. And hit submit. So while the questions are being tabulated, we're going to meet our panelists. And more details about our panelists are in the chat box. Um, first is Rebe Rebecca Glenberg, who is a senior staff attorney at the ACLU of Illinois. Uh, Rebecca works on a range of issues, including free speech, voting rights, and immigrant rights. Ooh, we have polling results now. 40% of you think of them often, 44 think about them sometimes, 9% don't think about them much. And uh, Hopefully, the 9% will move mm -hmm. on to those top two after we're done. Um, our second panelist is Peter Hanna. He is a legal advisor on privacy and technology with the ACLU of Illinois, and he's also a board member and a professor of law at Kent University. Peter has broad experience providing legal and strategic guidance on complex issues at the intersection of technology and law. And last but not least is Harper Reed. He's a technologist, an entrepreneur, and hacker. And he spends most of his life building things, hacking things, and talking about doing both of those things. So welcome, panelists. Um, so on March 9th, with 11 confirmed cases of COVID-19, Governor Pritzker declared all counties in our state a disaster area in response to the COVID-19 outbreak. As of today, Illinois has seen uh, close to 7,000 deaths, and over 143 positive tests have been performed. We've heard about contact tracing being used by the government to help limit the spread of COVID-19 and tech companies are getting involved in contact tracing. Harper, could you start, to start us off by telling us what is contact tracing and should we rely on tech to address this spread? Well, th thank you, Katie, for having me. And um, I, I can tell you about contact <laughs> tracing. The first thing I have to say is that um, I am not a public health professional. My background is on the technology side. And so there's this whole part of this, which is this the public health side, which is this amazing kind of thing that we've used for almost 100 years um, to defeat epidemics, and that is contact tracing. And really what this is, is it's about finding someone who is sick from some virus or what have you, an STD or really anything, and then understanding how they um, came to be sick with that so that we can better model and understand how viruses are spreading within our communities to kind of defeat that. A lot of it is about um, following that kind of path and then making sure that the people who are most affected are able to get, have a public health intervention. Um, and that's largely contact tracing. And how this looks in reality is um, I, let's say I go and get a positive or I go do a, a COVID test, I get a positive response. Um, and then there's some sort of intervention. Maybe someone calls me on the phone, a text message, depending on the locale where I live in. Um, and they call me on the phone and they say, hey, you have a positive response uh, or, or result from this, this test. Um, and then from there, they might ask me some questions. They might say, you know, can you um, remember who you've talked to? Um, are you interested in sharing the, that information? And the idea here is that by sharing that, then that public health person can call those people and notify 
notify them that, hey, they were exposed to COVID and maybe it's time for you to go get a test and isolate. And the goal here is to do an early notification of exposure because we know that anyone who has an early notification of exposure has more of a likelihood of, of getting the care they need and, and, and ultimately surviving. Um, and that's the goal. Um, where this gets a little thorny or a little tricky is when we start automating this. Um, what is a largely anachronistic kind of um, experience. Someone calls you on the phone or they knock on your door um, and they talk to you um, is, is being automated um, by many companies, Apple and Google, in, in, including Apple and Google, I guess. And um, they're, they're releasing this as what they're calling exposure notification. Um, and what this does is it takes out a lot of the public health aspects and adds in a lot of technology. So we all have our devices, our little devices. And, and what it does is it these devices send out a little signal um, just constantly. I mean, they're already sending out lots of signals. This is just an additional signal over Bluetooth, and then that interacts with devices. So maybe I'm walking along in the park. Um, I see Peter. My phone connects to Peter's phone, and we just send some signals back and forth. Then the next thing I know, I see Kadeen. Same signals back and forth, and I see Rebecca. We're sitting at a park bench together. And life goes on, um, and then maybe the next day I get a COVID test, and it says, Harper, you were positive. And then what my phone does is I just say, oh, I'm positive, and I do that through verification of a test result, so I can't just do it for fun. Um, but I say, I'm positive on my phone, and then it sends out a signal um, to the internet, and, then, and that signal is just an ID that said, these are the numbers that I saw, these are the IDs I saw. And the thing that's important about this is it puts that on the internet and it marks those IDs as positive. Um, and then Peter, Rebecca, and Kadeen's phones look at the internet and they say, oh, these IDs are positive. This person is positive. Um, and then they can be notified. Now, I, I'm playing this back as I just said this. and I did a terrible job of describing this. Um, and I think that's demonstrative of how complicated it is. Um, really what is happening is your phone is sending out signals. Other phones are listening. And then if your phone is marked as positive, um, it puts the signals that it sent out on the internet. And other phones get to look at that and say, okay, these signals have been positive. Um, what this means is that it is theoretically privacy preserving. I say that in quotations because it's very speculative. We don't know what some of the liabilities are, et cetera. But the, but the design by Apple and Google was to protect privacy. Um, what this allows is, once again, early notification of COVID-19. It allows for someone like myself or any of us, or really the 80% of people that have smartphones, um, to be able to um, participate in a system that um, notifies you of early exposure. But this is only if everyone uses it. Um, so I think, I mean, I could go on forever, but I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to waste too much time here. Um, is that good? Is that, is that helpful, Katie and Peter, Rebecca? That's super helpful. And we've been having conversations with policymakers at the city and state level because they're thinking through what's the best approach. And we've shared some principles that we believe help ensure privacy protections that are built, that should be built into any contact tracing system. So I'm going to mention a few of them and let me know from your experience is that similar to what you've been hearing with the folks in the tech community. So one of the things that we've really stressed is um, robust security. So making sure that there is decentralized storage of data whenever possible. We also want to minimize the data that's collected to only information that's necessary to identify contacts and to keep keep them safe. We want a voluntary process. Um, we want to build in mechanisms to assess the effectiveness and impact of the contact tracing system. We want uh, entities to remain transparent about who the vendor or the company is, who the government is contracting with to build a contact tracing system. And we also want to focus on public health and helping people who've been exposed to the disease when using the contact tracing system. So these things that we've talked about in the context of uh, government um, coming up with these context uh, tracing systems or utilizing them, are those similar to what you're hearing that tech people are using? Um, is there a place for tech folks in contact tracing? What are the pros and the cons? Well, like all things with technology, it's very nuanced. I would say that for the most part, People are wanting, they're, as I've described it many times, a lot of the tech folks building these things are very well intended, but that doesn't get us very far. That, you, that just means that their, their intentions are, are maybe pure. Um, in technology, when I'm building uh, an app for my phone, like when I think about the stuff that I've built in the past, my background, I was a CTO for the Obama campaign. Some of the stuff we built for Obama, for example, which are very simple apps that did a very simple thing, but they were centralized. So all the data you put in here went to one central server. Um, and there's this new way 
it's not new, new, but it's a new way that, that a lot of the technology around COVID is being built, where it's decentralized. And the key here is that you don't have one entity that owns the data in that one centralized place. Um, and I think this is where the division is. On one side, you have a lot of folks who are building legacy applications. Um, you're building kind of applications the way it used to be, where it's centralized. And you have, and some of these companies are, are great companies doing good stuff, but it's centralized. Um, it's subpoenaable, the data is available, it's hackable. Um, not that the decentralized is not hackable, it's just it's not centralized. And so then you have this other side, which is the decentralized. On this side, um, the data is not stored in one single place. It's stored only on your device, your data on your device. That's one of the, I think, the attractive ideas is that only your device holds your data. Um, and so then you use all these privacy technologies like differential privacy to, to make sure that you're pushing up the data that isn't exactly your data, but looks like your data. So you're not actually leaking data about yourself. What this means though, is that you don't have one server that can be subpoenaable. You don't have one server that can be attacked or hacked. Um, you don't have one centralized kind of infrastructure. Um, there's some downsides as well. Um, the centralization does offer some benefit for um, analytics and looking at this and, and kind of getting a better idea. And so there's this constant tension. So everything you said, KD, and I think is exactly correct. And when I look at the work that we did, where we did on ExposureNotification.org, where we wrote up a, a big kind of um, individual data rights around exposure notification, it's, it's exactly, you know, that's exactly the, the type of ideas we have. The one difference that I really want to kind of underline is the difference between centralized and decentralized. Awesome. So I think this is a good time for another poll question to ask, would you download a government contact tracing app? And while people are responding to that poll question, um, just to switch within the COVID structure, but just a, a different kind of question is, um, we've been hearing folks say that because we're in a pandemic, our focus should be on saving lives and that should mean, that could mean giving up our privacy and civil liberties rights. Um, and that argument about foregoing privacy for the greater good has come up in the context of law enforcement agencies and other first responders across Illinois asking for a list of names and addresses of people who have tested positive for COVID-19. Rebecca, can you tell Tell uh, the folks why and how we at the ACLU of Illinois have pushed back on the re release of pers personal medical information to first responders. Yeah, um, and and I will say, you know, it, it, as a general matter, the ACLU and on all of these COVID issues recognizes um, that certain things that we have to do to protect public health are things that in normal times we would view as an unacceptable infringement of our rights, um, like telling people to stay home all the time. Um, but um, sort of the touchstone for these potential limitations on individual liberty is whether the science justifies um, those infringements. So based on what the public health experts tell us, um, is, is this, are these various um, restrictions or infringements on our liberty um, actually helping us to fight the pandemic? And is it the only alternative? Are there other ways that um, you could get the same kind of protections without infringing on individual liberties in the same way? So with all of these COVID questions, that's, um, those are sort of the first questions that the ACLU um, asks. Um, so in the, in the case of these um, um, first responders who have asked public health departments um, for names and or addresses of people who have tested positive, um, what we have heard consistently from public health experts is that, first of all, that kind of a system damages public health um, rather than protects it and that it does not, um, n does not really protect first responders either and may even make their job more dangerous. Um, so when we talk about the public health overall, um, as sort of you can gather just from the description of contract case tracing that Harper just gave us, you know, information um, about where the virus is uh, how fast it's spreading, um, those sorts of things are really essential to uh, controlling the virus. 
And in order for us to get that information, people need to feel comfortable going and getting tested um, when they are worried that they're exhibiting symptoms or that they may have been exposed. Um, people need to feel um, um, like they're able to um, go and get tested without any adverse consequences. So you can imagine that when people's um, private health information may be um, disseminated if they go and get a test, that is going to deter a lot of people from getting a test. And moreover, um, you know, it'll especially um, deter people who um, have some special reason for not wanting the police to know their identity or their location, or who have just general concerns about um, their identity or location um, being exposed. So think about um, undocumented immigrants don't really want their name and address to be in any kind of database that's going to go to law enforcement. Um, uh, survivors of sexual violence um, may have, may be trying very hard to conceal their location from, um, from prior abusers who may very well be first responders. Um, so you have um, this whole, you know, you have this whole public health system that relies on getting this information from people, um, and yet um, you're deterring people from giving up that information the more that you disclose it, especially to law enforcement. Thanks so much. Um, so just to hop back quickly to Harper before we talk about Clearview. So Harper, in a one minute or, or less, can you give it a sense of, so other than contact tracing and release of personal medical information, what other tech and practices might the government or private companies start using in an attempt to respond to the pandemic and as we continue the reopening process? And should people be wary of that? So a minute and a half to say all of that yeah. in an hour. <laughs> great, great. So I think the answer is yes, people should be very concerned. I think the most concerning um, technology that I've seen has been around health passports. So these are um, health credentials, basically something on your phone or a piece of paper or something that says that you are free of COVID and so therefore you can work. Um, but many of these systems do not offer ways to abstain. They don't offer ways to get out. Um, and in, in many cases, um, you, know, you, you won't be let into a job or you won't be let into a space unless you participate. And you can't participate without putting your data into some sort of centralized system. And I think there's a lot of concern around that. And I think we'll start to see much more about this um, and probably have its own kind of um, hour long session itself. Awesome. So speaking of tech, last week, uh, the ACLU filed a case on behalf of Mr. Robert Williams, who was arrested and spent time in jail for a crime he didn't commit based on floor, flawed facial recognition technology that resulted in a faulty match. Uh, facial recognition systems are becoming more common in our cities, and it's become a big business that law enforcement agencies across the country have embraced. Peter, can you give a brief description of the technology, uh, how it's used, and why it raises privacy and civil liberties? concerns? Yeah, of course. And, and, and thank you, uh, Kadeen and uh, Rebecca and Harper and, and the entire ACLU family for, uh, for putting this important town hall together. Um, so just like your fingerprints and your DNA, uh, each human face has a specific geometry uh, that can be represented with a unique value. Um, you know, typically the most important facial features that a uh, camera looks for in a facial recognition uh, system are your eyes, your nose, and your mouth. Those are sort of the, the three sort of things that drive it. Um, but you know, it also means that some facial recognition technologies could make a positive ID on me with just my nose if it's a clear enough image. Um, so ultimately, uh, you know, this raises a ton of issues because cameras have gotten much, much better at getting, you know, accurate footage of people in crowds at a distance. Um, and as cameras have gotten more powerful, they can capture that geometry data in crowds and that geometry data can then be measured against or compared to a database of facial geometry that's been accumulated from other sources. So Clearview went out and they took all the public profile pictures that we have on Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter and everything else that's been publicly made that has a positive match to a name. They created a huge database and they extracted the facial geometry data from those public images. Then they reached out to law enforcement and pretty much any, any other party that wanted it and said, hey, we, can, we have a database of you know, several hundred million in the US, uh, US billion worldwide, people and we can, if you give us your input, your faces, your 
you know, surveillance footage, we can check it out against our database. And once we know that's Peter Hanna at that protest, well, you know, law enforcement can see if are there any warrants, is there any reason or pretext even to go after him. Um, so, you know, it really, facial recognition just fundamentally raises uh, a huge array of civil liberties concerns, but in the interest of time, I'll focus on two. First, it is, it is the nightmare dystopic scenario of just ubiquitous human surveillance. You can't go outside of your house without a machine knowing you are you and you are where you are doing the thing you're doing at any given time. So you blanket a place with cameras, you hook it up to the Clearview database, you're going to figure out who like 95% of the people are, certainly anyone who's ever uploaded a photo to the internet. Um, and, and the second thing is, it's not perfect technology. These algorithms are made by people um, and these people bring their biases into them. So there have been studies that have shown that, you know, among people of color, uh, facial recognition is much, much less reliable. Uh, you know, different genders, there's huge reliability gaps. Um, and in fact, we learned uh, just, uh, you know, very recently, a gentleman in Detroit uh, by the name of uh, Robert Williams, an ACLU client to the ACLU of, of Michigan, was wrongly arrested on the basis of faulty facial recognition. He was brought into the precinct. He had his, you know, fingerprints done, mugshot, everything. And it wasn't until much later that they realized we've got the wrong guy. So, I mean, th these, are, these are really, really big issues. And it's why we've seen many cities adopt complete bans on facial recognition, which I think is, is important. Rebecca, uh, Peter mentioned Clairview when he was describing facial recognition technology. We recently sued Clairview. Can you give us an overview of why we sued them and what's the goal of the lawsuit against Clairview? Yeah, so as Peter um, indicated, Clearview is the most sort of pernicious and giant facial recognition um, program that we have seen to date because they scrape up all of the publicly available images on the internet. So they have about 3 billion um, face prints in their database. And so, you know, when uh, law enforcement or anyone else who has the app um, takes a picture of someone and uploads it, it's not only like instant identification of that person, but also any of the information about that person that is associated with their photograph in whatever um, social media or news outlet or um, database it was that picture was found um, so it's um, it's incredibly dangerous um, and it violates an Illinois law which is pretty unique um, called the biometric information privacy act which says that um, if you're going to collect someone's biometric information that is identifying information that um, comes from a person's own body, so like a, a, a fingerprint, an iris scan, or a face print, um, you need to give that person notice. Um, you need to get their consent to create that, um, that face print out of their photograph. Um, you need to um, tell them how it's going to be used, when it's going to be destroyed, who, if anyone, it's going to be shared with. There are all sorts of um, ways in which this Illinois statute allows everyone to control their own biometric information. Um, and needless to say, um, Clearview in automatically vacuuming up all of these images all over the internet um, is not getting people's notice or consent um, and um, in that way is violating the law in Illinois in particular. So, you know, um, we want them to stop violating that law um, either by stop uh, stopping um, generating face prints out of our images here in Illinois or um, provide the notice and consent that's required under our law. And at the same time, we hope that the litigation serves as another way to educate people about the dangers of this technology and motivate people um, to um, seek ways that we, um, as holders of our own information, can protect ourselves. And, and I just want to build on what Rebecca said, just to preview sort of a point that we're going to talk about later, because we're going to talk about practical tips and protesting and stuff. Um, you know, we have this sort of illusion that when we upload a photo to the internet, um, you know, just me sitting in my office or whatever, uh, and make it public that really no harm can come. Uh, I upload it to Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever. Um, but what this shows is every single detail that you put on the internet, especially when those details or images include immutable characteristics like your facial geometry, it's there forever. 
And, you know, companies like Facebook, companies like LinkedIn, you know, your rights with respect to who and how they share your information are extremely limited. So I think one of the big sort of sea changes that has to occur in, in the culture of, of our digital culture is we all need to be more deliberative, uh, deliberate and thoughtful about what we are putting out there. Um, you know, people I see all the time, people are putting pictures of their, their young children, babies, toddlers, teenagers. Um, and I think to myself, you know, I obviously don't have kids, but I, I think to myself, how could people be doing this um, knowing that this is their forever and their relationship with Facebook, with Google, with LinkedIn, with Amazon, et cetera, is so, so limited in terms of the rights they have. So just, I want everyone who's participating to keep that in mind. Uh, Harper, so are there, so Peter kind of shared what the average person should do. Do you have suggestions of what developers should consider? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I think the first thing is that us developers, the people building this technology, we need to be really thoughtful about the impact that our technology has. I do think, you know, my own experience working on the Obama campaign, inventing with that great team, a lot of really good technology that we thought was going, you know, and, and did elect Barack Obama. And then later to see that same technology be used to spread misinformation around Ukraine, um, and then also to elect Donald Trump. Like, this is a very confusing thing for me as a technologist, because we, we did not intend that. And I think this is most technologists don't have that experience to understand what happens when their technology is, is used in unintended ways. Um, we are seeing some of the leaders of the computer vision and the facial recognition kind of movement uh, stop doing the work because they don't like the direction it's going. Um, and I think developers need to sit back and they really need to think, is this something that is making the world better? Is this what I intend? If this is, how could this be used wrong? How could this be used um, in a nefarious way? What would a Bond villain do? Go through all of these exercises, as silly as it may sound, because if at any point you come to a conclusion, well, this could be used to hurt people, um, this could be used to hurt communities that are already most vulnerable, then I think you should really stop and think, is this worth doing? Um, if it is worth doing, I think it's worthwhile really investing in privacy-preserving technologies. Oftentimes, this increases technology, but, or increases the complexity of the technology, but it's so important. One thing that you know, I'm seeing a lot around the COVID stuff is the technology works great um, if you are you know, a rich white dude and you have nothing to worry about in this kind of silly way where it's like, it's not that you have nothing to hide, it's just that you're already participating in this stuff. But if you're one of the communities that are already vulnerable to COVID-19, the technology just doesn't help you. That's a failing of technology. The technologists themselves should be thinking about this and solving these problems. It's the same with computer vision. We really need to be thinking about how could this be misused and making sure that we are doing everything in our power to make sure it does not be misused. Rebecca, uh, someone asked, Scott wanted to know uh, about the status of the Clearview litigation. Can you tell us where it is? Yeah, it's really just at its very beginning. We just filed the lawsuit last week um, and Clearview has not yet even responded to it. So um, nothing has happened is where it is. And if you follow us on social media, if you subscribe to our action alerts, uh, you will find more information about what's happening with our litigation. Uh, Peter, um, so in addition to facial recognition technology, what are, the, what are some of the uh, other recent police uses of technology that the public should be aware of? Um, great question. So I think uh, I, I, we could, you know, kind of like what Harper said, I think any of these questions could be hour long, you know, multi-day uh, response, but I'll focus on just three in the interest of time. Um, first, I would say drones. Um, you know, they've been around for a long time, but they're getting more and more sophisticated. And, you know, we've seen military drones flying over our cities here domestically, um, you know, but also the next generation of drones are like handheld, like pocket drones. They're already in use in the military. And, and um, you know, as many of us know, we, we have this pipeline in the U.S. where military gear finds its way in our law enforcement. So just being aware of the presence of drones and being really attuned to what our law enforcement, uh, you know, what technology our law enforcement's using. So that's one. Second thing that I think people might not have heard of are these uh, reverse warrants or geofence warrants. And this isn't actually technology the police use in terms of hardware. It's technology the police use in terms of your phone and Google and, and other parties. And the way these work um, are uh, police will go out and they'll ask for a warrant, uh, basically uh, to get from Google the unique identification of every phone or you know, smart device in a certain region for a certain time. Then they will get a big list from Google and they will narrow it down based on whatever you know, attributes or, or requirements they've got. And then they'll go back to Google and say, tell us who these people are by name. 
And then Google will give them an entire, you know, big list of names. And then at that point, the police could be, you know, basically free to go to anyone's house and ask them questions, seek their consent to search their home. Um, it really is, it, it flips sort of the, the warrant requirement and turns into a phishing expedition. Um, you know, so the, really what this shows is kind of the risk when I just have my phone in my pocket, I could be walking by the scene of a, of a you know, alleged crime. And just because I happen to be in a three or four block radius, I'm now a person of interest to the police. Um, so that's a big thing, reverse or geofence warrants. And I think people are going to hear more and more about them uh, as police use them more and more. Um, and then lastly, kind of in a big sort of large bucket um, is just the, the increasing use of artificial intelligence technologies by law enforcement on data sets that already exist. So they're able to crunch information in a way using sophisticated algorithms to make you know, non-obvious inferences. But again, just like with facial recognition, where you have algorithmic bias, you have that in the AI world uh, as well. And it's ultimately, you know, it's not true it's artificial intelligence. It's a human-made artificial intelligence that brings the human's biases and, and, and uh, limitations there too. So I think we need to be really mindful of at least those three because I think they pose a huge, huge risk to civil liberties. Great, so I think let's do another poll question. So our next one will be, how concerned are you about private companies like Amazon, Google, Facebook, et cetera, sharing your personal information with law enforcement? So your options are not concerned, somewhat concerned, very concerned. So um, Peter, I'm gonna stick with you. Um, we've been getting a lot of questions about protecting your privacy, especially now when there are people around the country are protesting police brutality and anti-black racism. And it feels like while people are taking to the streets, police are using more and more surveillance technology. Um, can you describe some practical tips that people can take to ensure their privacy and security of data and decrease the chance of being identified by technology while protesting? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, right off the top, and I think uh, just quickly, the poll results um, corroborate what I think we all feel in our hearts. The majority, 73%, are very concerned about private companies getting, uh, sharing our, our information with law enforcement. Um, but back to the, to the question at hand, how could people who are participating in protests and activists protect themselves? There's a number of things. I mean, the first thing is, you know, smart protection of your digital privacy starts at home. It starts before you walk out the door, before you, you know, even decide to go to the protest. So be mindful of your data trail and the data that you're generating before you even head out to the uh, a demonstration. Um, the, si the single simplest piece of advice is also the hardest for most people, uh, which is leave your phone at home. Like if you can leave your phone at home, leave your phone at home. That's not a, a cure-all. You're still going to be subject to facial recognition and all sorts of other stuff, but it's going to go a really long way. Um, if you can't uh, leave your phone at home, um, you know, there are other options, but I, I know a lot of activists who have got, you know, disposable phones, burner phones, you know, you can get one for literally 20 or 30 bucks. And I know that's still obviously a cost, but that's an option to get a burner phone. But if you, if you can't get a burner phone, you can't leave your phone at home, uh, you have a few, few options. So one, uh, keep your phone off or in airplane mode the, you know, the entire time that you can do so. Um, ultimately, you know, if that's not going to be feasible, turn off your GPS, turn off your Wi-Fi, turn off your Bluetooth. By GPS, I mean your location services. Um, you know, these settings should be, if you have an Android or an iOS uh, iPhone, you should be pretty easy to find. Um, you should also make sure your phone is encrypted. Now, if you have a passcode on your iPhone, good news, your phone is encrypted. Um, on Android, you have to go into the settings and sort of uh, say, please, you know, encrypt my phone. Um, and, you know, it will be encrypted as well. Uh, footnote, please, you, please don't make your passcode one, two, three, four, five, six, please, please anything but, you know, but that or zero, 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 um, try to make it difficult. Um, you should also, uh, best practices, um, according to best practices, you should also disable your biometric identifiers if you, if you can. So before you get to the protest, turn off the facial recognition, turn off the thumbprints, turn all that stuff off. We, the, the legal area, the, the jurisprudence around this is really unsettled. There's one, you know, district court, very, uh, you know, lower court decision that, you know, the biometrics can't be forced to be input to unlock a phone, but it's a completely unsettled area. One area that is settled is the police cannot make you enter your passcode. So if the only way to get into your phone is with a passcode, that's the only way to get to your phone and they can't force you to do it. Um, in, next up, I would say in terms of communication, a lot of people go to these protests with other folks and obviously they're texting, tweeting, et cetera. Um, please, please download an app, ideally like Signal. 
Signal is a great app. It is end-to-end -end encrypted. Be that person in your friend group who is annoying to your friends and forces all of them to also download Signal. Um, there are other options. I I'm personally use Signal. Um, it also has a really good feature where uh, that they just rolled out where if you take a picture and there are people in it, there's a little button, you click it, it will automatically blur all the faces in the image, which leads me to my next point. Um, if you're uploading things to social media, please be mindful of what you're uploading. Please be mindful that there are people, other people in these, in these photos who could be identified and abused by law enforcement or, or you know, pursued for no reason on the basis of their race, skin color, et cetera. So be mindful. If you are uploading something, be sure to scrub out every single piece of information that could be identifying of you or other protesters and activists um, to the extent possible. You should also be aware that doesn't just mean, you know, blurring faces. It also means the metadata in your photos, the EXIF data. Um, a lot of applications let you scrub that out um, as well. Um, so I think at a very high level, you know, those are really the, the big things. You can really, this is sort of, again, it could be another discussion in and of itself, but best thing, leave your phone at home, put it in airplane mode if you got to bring it, make sure you're mindful of what you're taking pictures of and sharing, um, and communicate using encrypted tools like Signal. So uh, anyone can answer this question. It's from Mark to any of the panelists. Should I wear a hat, mask, dark glasses, hood every time I go out in public? Definitely should wear a mask for the foreseeable future. Yes. Um, I'll just add, so for facial recognition, literally just you know your nose is enough to potentially identify you. It's funny, sometimes you'll see people wearing like the baklavas, uh, uh, balaclavas, sorry, I tell you, it's almost dinner time for me, so I'm thinking <laughs> about food. The balaclavas, which have, you know, pretty much everything covered except like this. Well, guess what? You're giving them your eyes and your nose and you're still going to be identified. Um, there's actually a company uh, called U URME. They make a, a paper surveillance mask. You can go to their website. You can download it. You can print it out. And if you, it's actually someone else's face. It's an artist's face. You can literally tape that to your face and it will throw off uh, facial recognition. Um, but going out with a, you know, full face coverings every time you go out, it's up to you. Uh, certainly a mask is necessary during this pandemic, but um, the only way to truly defeat facial recognition, and I think this is one of the submitted questions, is you got to cover eyes, nose, mouth. Um, and you can't do that with, you know, a half measure. So it's sort of you're all in or you, you accept that you might be caught by facial recognition. Thanks, Peter. So um, just going back to COVID and that intersection with protesting, um, I was on a call with somebody from New York recently, and they shared that testing could be really, um, access to testing can be really difficult. But if somebody attended a protest, then they can get tested pretty quickly. But folks, especially activists and protesters, were reluctant to go get tested and disclose that information, especially since we've seen at least one example of law enforcement, I think in uh, Minneapolis, who used the term contact tracing to refer to arresting protesters who may have been engaged in civil disobedience. Uh, to any of the group, um, what policy and practice suggestions would you have for public health departments and governments that will allow for testing that won't chill testing for folks who've been engaged in protesting? Uh, and yeah, let's start there. I can jump in. Um, yeah. So I've been really impressed with a lot of the public health folks that I've interacted with over the last four or five months where um, many of them are very aware of these issues. Um, contact tracing itself is built on the premise of context, which means that when someone is interviewing me because I have become positive, that they are expecting me to not include all the details because they, because they know that people have, you know, mistresses, drug dealers, etc. stuff that, that's just private that they're not willing to share, especially to a random person. Um, or just you just don't want to share your location like that is something that is expected within these contact tracers So public health people are very aware of this um, I think the problem comes not with the public health people for the most part But with a lot of the implementation a lot of the private organizations that are doing this the public health people I've worked with are very concerned about the chilling effects that happen when you say things like the like the police person said in Minnesota about where contact tracing um, the, the protesters, um, they're very worried about that because they know that public health only works with um, a continued public health intervention. It's all about trust. Um, I would look to our private organizations that are running a lot of these programs, that are running this to make sure that they are practicing very good um, 
I don't know the right word for it. It's just like, it, it's almost like behavior. Like there's this expectation that we should share our data um, to, to solve COVID. But I, I do think if we listen to a lot of the public health folks, like if you look at Resolve to Save Lives, for, ex for example, or Partners in Health, you know, they're all about sharing the right amount of data and making sure that you have context, which isn't all the data. And I think that's the big thing. So I don't think I have a good answer for you, Katie. And I hope that was, that was helpful though. That was super helpful. Thank you. Peter, Rebecca, anything to add to that? I think that was a great answer and really comprehensive. Thanks, Harper. Yeah, and you know, I think in general with all of these things, um, it's also important that you have public health databases that are not interacting with and talking to other government databases really of any kind. It should be isolated the way that the census is census data is isolated so that to maximize people's um, comfort level in, in giving up information. Can, can I, there's one point I want to build on just what Rebecca said and Harper said, which is uh, we've, we've taken like the COVID-19 contact tracing. It's really interesting to look at it as a case study, right? Because you can see that the, uh, the ACLU and Harper, and myself, others, you know, who are Apple, Google, they've looked really hard about the privacy interests here as we do contact tracing. Like we got to be thinking about how long this data is stored. We got to be thinking about who it's shared with. We gotta be thinking about how much we need it for, like what we need it for. These are exactly the type of questions all of us should always be asking all the time about any sort of use of our personal information by the government, by large private companies, and by institutions. So I think one of the very few upsides of this entire pandemic is I think it's really brought to light that these are the sorts of analyses that we need to be conducting on a normal basis to change and kind of migrate our digital culture and our thinking from sort of like a hands off, like, ah, oh, well, it's easy to use Google Maps to something more deliberate and more thoughtful because, you know, if we don't do that, if we don't assert our rights and we don't hold on to our privacy, it will be gone forever. Um, it's, it's, it's really important that we think about it all the time. And kind of related to that, John um, has a question and, or more of a comment or request in the chat. He was really excited about your tips, Peter, and he wanted to know if we at the ACLU would have the capacity to put together a primer on these things that could be shared with other folks, best practices. Um, I will speak for Peter and I may also speak for Harper to consult and my colleague Sapna and other folks in our organization, Rebecca, to say yes, we would love to do that for you um, and it will be forthcoming and um, uh, when? sometime soon, but thank you for that suggestion and we would love to follow up on that. It's one of Peter's favorite things to talk about, so um, I think I could easily twist his arm to help us in that endeavor. Um, so I, I guess the next question that I have, um, and this was one of the questions we got in advance of, of our town hall, was around the risk of surveillance going beyond the protests and marches, that we know people often feel safer and more private at home, but sometimes their electronic activities, uh, even beyond their phone, are less private than they seem. Can you also include some privacy tips for people at home as they go about their lives? Um, yeah, sure. I, so just, uh, again, could be a very long answer, and maybe this is another sort of resource we should put together, like, you know, privacy at protests, privacy at home. Um, so I'm just going to focus on two things in the interest of time. So first, um, your web activity, right? Your web activity, uh, other than maybe your, your geolocation, is probably the single most telling thing about the most intimate details of, of your life, you know, and my life and our lives. So um, your web activity uh, is you know, could be recovered by law enforcement, sometimes even without a warrant. Um, so if you can afford a VPN, it is a small but very helpful step uh, in protecting the privacy around your web activity. Um, you know, what the VPN does, and it, it, just to simplify it, is it, it sort of hides your web traffic and good VPNs will encrypt all your web traffic so that it can only be decrypted by the place you were trying to go. You're trying to go to amazon.com, all the stuff in between, even your ISP might not be able to see that you're going to amazon.com, but by the time that your request to access that website comes up, Amazon can decrypt it and serve you back the data. So there are free VPNs out there, but I got to warn um, against them because the way they're free, just like everything is, yep. they sell your yep. data. So it kind of defeats the purpose. It's like, uh, oh cool, a free VPN. Um, VPNs generally are, uh, they're, they're not super costly, but it is a cost again, um, you know, typically around like, you know, four or five bucks a month. Um, and there are many really good reputable ones. Um, this, you know, is not really the forum to like plug anything, but you know, if you saw my email, it's a proton mail address that I, I use for, for a lot of stuff. 
Proton uh, Mail people are in Switzerland and they're associated, affiliated with CERN, the uh, physics research group. Um, and they also have a VPN that's pretty good. Uh, Private internet access is another one. Um, I think uh, Harper might have some uh, additional recommendations um, as well. Uh, the, the second thing I would emphasize for privacy at home is if you have a connected device in your home with a microphone or a camera, you must assume that that information can be provided to law enforcement, probably without a warrant. Um, there's an old uh, Supreme Court doctrine called the third party doctrine, which is still good law, which basically says that if I share private personal information with a third party that I have no relationship with, there's no expectation of privacy at all. Do you have an expectation of privacy with the data that you transact uh, over Facebook, over Google, over Gmail, et cetera? Not really. I mean, that's a complete third party that you have no special relationship with. So be really mindful. Uh, and, and I always encourage people to do what I consider like a privacy and security audit in the home. Take a look, see what, you know, does your refrigerator really need to be connected to the internet? You know, does your toaster oven need to be, have a microphone? You know, does your TV need to have a webcam looking back at you? Um, be aware of the devices that are connected in the house and be mindful of the settings around those devices because if you have an Amazon Alexa device, you might look into it and see that there are settings that allow Amazon to scoop up a lot of data for, you know, testing purposes or to better respond to your questions. Disable that. You know, if you got to have an Amazon Echo in your, in your home, disable that. And you should do this exercise as part of a privacy and security audit for every connected device in your home. But um, I, I want to stop there and, and, and turn to Harper and see if he has any thoughts on VPNs and other advice for, uh, for privacy, security in the home. Well, I mean, your, your recommendations are right on. Um, I think those are, that's exactly the right thing. I, I mean, I think the best thing that I use is Signal. I use Signal a lot. I think it's very good. Um, it also has good telephony, so you can make calls with it, um, which are encrypted. Um, I mean, the, 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 the voice assistants like, you know, Google Home, Alexa, et cetera, it's very, very hard to have those in your home in a, in a secure fashion or in a private fashion. And so, um, you know, although they're entertaining and sometimes they're helpful, there's other ways to check the weather. And so it's just about understanding, you know, what, what are you willing to share to these big corporates, um, knowing the, the risks. Um, I, I do think that there is a, you know, there is a lot of really cool technology that's coming out that is, and it is already out, you know, you know, Google Home or Alexa, this, that's a very good example. And, and there's also um, alternatives where the entire data lives inside of your house. Um, and so um, I don't think it's worthwhile just listing them all out here, but, but I do think that, you know, there are ways to find, and then maybe, maybe we can provide a list or, or, or at least some pointers on where you can find that on how do you find, um, you know, whether it's security cameras or whether it's voice assistants or whatever, where the data itself um, it lives entire, entirely inside of your house. It is owned by you. It's not shared with any third party, et cetera. Um, I think that's really important. And that's kind of my practice. Um, although I do have a Google Home, um, and every time I in these conversations, I'm like, Ooh. Um, I do, I do um, make sure that most everything I have is, is um, stored locally to my house um, and in my office. I think that's important. That, that's, that's a great point. And, and just you remind me of one other thing, which is if you've got a home computer and a, you know, hard drives, obviously, you can encrypt your home computer very easily. There's a lot of really good software. Um, I, I used to use a software called TrueCrypt. Um, and uh, what this does is it you know, means if I ripped your hard drive out of your computer, took it to my forensic uh, lab without a warrant and tried to just hack into it, um, it I'd have a much harder time <laughs> if it's encrypted uh, than if it's not. So look into home, you know, computer encryption as well, um, especially if you're using a PC. Great. And just so folks know, in the chat, I linked to uh, two fact sheets from an ACLU initiative called Protecting Household Privacy Act. Um, it's something that was sponsored by Representative Ann Williams and Senator Christina Castro. And if you're concerned about law enforcement having access to the information from your household devices, please support that bill when we send you an action alert. Uh, that would be fantastic. Um, so I think it's time for another poll question. So this poll question, you have to, after you heard it from Harper, Rebecca, and Peter about this area, you have to be open to being honest about what you own. So do you own a smart home device? Uh, something like a Google, Alexa, smart fridge, the options are yes, no, unsure. Uh, Harper was brave enough to disclose that he does. Um, so mm. we're all a work in progress. We all are. <laughs> so 
Great. Um, there was a question uh, in the chat about protecting ourselves from surveillance in hotel rooms. Anyone has a quick response to that? I can certainly jump in. So I traveled before COVID quite a bit. Um, and, you know, one thing that um, when I traveled internationally, um, I would always try and use, um, I would basically not connect to the hotel Wi-Fi. Um, oftentimes, especially in, in um, you know, various adversarial internet countries, um, the, the hotel Wi-Fi is a great way where you can, where people are, are scraping data and whatnot and selling it or just using it against you. Um, so, you so I've done that all over the world and I use, um, um, T-Mobile has very good international plans. That's a good way. Um, I know there's a lot on the internet about like bug finders or camera finders, and I would just be very cautious and um, because a lot of that is um, fake. They're just, you know, they're just kind of like fake technology that doesn't work. Um, but yeah, and, and I saw that, um, I saw that Danny asked if, if what about using a, a VPN? I do use a VPN on top of hotel Wi-Fi, but I try and for the most part only use um, internet that I control. Um, and that can be hard. Um, so, you know, it is, it is a complication and, and sometimes you, you can't afford to, to, to have slow internet or whatever. Um, and so you just have to make that, that, that jump. And then to Danny's point, I would definitely use a VPN at that point. Peter, any, any other thing you can add? I, I, no, I, I, the only thing I would have said, I would have going to make the same point about like the equipment. There's so many websites that will sell you like an RF scanner, like, uh, which is typically, you know, and you see old spy movies and the Cold War, you know, the guys walking around the room with that little thing, that one. When they work, I mean, they work, but there's so many bogus pieces of tech out there that it's really hard to find one uh, that is trustworthy. But, you know, use a VPN in the hotel and do, honestly, do a, a visual inspection. Um, oftentimes, you know, uh, unless you're head of state or something, it's probably, uh, you know, unlikely that a hotel would risk its reputation by, by, by bugging uh, the room. But, you know, short of getting like a real RF scanner and checking every inch of the room, um, you could do a visual inspection, use a VPN, and don't disclose sensitive information in your hotel room. So there's a challenge from Jeffrey. In 25 words or less, what is a smart fridge? To Any me, fridge with a screen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, so, uh, that was a lot and I am seeing that we're answering questions that folks have had and uh, apologies for not being able to get to all of them, but uh, I just want to give the panelists maybe uh, two and a half minutes to um, leave the viewing audience with a takeaway of, uh, that you want people to leave with today after this wonderful conversation. I will start with Rebecca. Um, so my takeaway is that it's remarkable the way that these privacy issues intersect with so many other civil rights and civil liberties issues. So we've already talked on this um, in this forum about free speech rights. We've talked about um, race discrimination and how that gets converted into facial recognition and um, and in, up to and including police abuse and over policing of black communities. Um, we have talked about um, how, um, you know, so if you want to really target any particular group, um, you know, you can set up your uh, facial recognition or other surveillance technology um, in front of the mosque or um, the doctor's office or, you know, you, you can, it is a, it is a great aid in um, discrimination against any particular group. Um, so that is my takeaway is that, you know, it's not just sort of privacy in the abstract, but all of your other sort of um, rights um, and liberties are affected by the sort of um, use of surveillance technology. Peter? Um, yeah, so just three things. Um, almost 40 years ago, uh, Eisenhower in his farewell address talked about the military industrial complex. And I remember, um, you know, I was hoping uh, President Obama would talk about what I've, I've called the private public pipeline. Um, and I think when it comes to personal information, what we're seeing is just a merger of private private companies that collect tons of data in exchange for, you know, some 
you know, sometimes a very valuable service, but sometimes a nominal one, like a flashlight app. Um, and what we're seeing is a lot of the private data, privately held data collected by corporations is just seeping into the public space and back and forth. And I think just as, as much as the military industrial complex, something that we needed to watch out for and need to watch out for, and will always probably need to watch out for, I think this private public pipeline is like the next big, big threat to our civil liberties and, and civil rights in this country. Um, number two, I, I just want people to think about, we, we've talked about a lot of like bite-sized specific things, right? Like contact tracing, like protest privacy, smart devices. Um, but there's, you know, Rebecca mentioned the intersectionality of privacy and, and, and uh, surveillance across many different areas. There's also intersectionality with respect to just how you live your life and how you live your digital life, right? You sign into your Amazon account with a Gmail login. Your, all your order confirmations, right? They go to your Gmail account. So it's not just Amazon who knows what you buy, it's also Google who knows what you buy. And Google has very, been very open about the fact they scan your emails to serve up ads, not just in Gmail, but in YouTube and elsewhere. So an easy thing anyone could do is try to like divide sort of the different sources to limit that kind of nefarious intersectionality. So you set up a ProtonMail account, they're free, make that your Amazon sign-in. Deprive Google of that information. If you have to have a Facebook account, link it to an entirely different email. Put in some, some additional information that might not be totally accurate. Um, because the more we can break those bonds that like link all these things across these different areas, the better. Um, and then the last thing I'd say is, you know, the ACLU, in it's a hundred year history, um, you know, incredible history focused on our rights and our liberties and, and I mean, play such a critical part in the American story. But one of the things about those rights and liberties over time is they've almost always been tangible. They've been corporeal, they've been like physical. You're depriving me of my liberty, right? You're depriving me of my life, my, my freedom, et cetera. When we talk about privacy, it's, it's intangible. It's non-corporeal, it's, it's ethereal. So it's really easy for us to just forget that this right exists and we have to fight for it just like we have to fight for the other rights that this you know, incredible organization has fought for for a century. But you're not, none of us are gonna be successful unless we help the ACLU. And to, to build on what Kadeen said and what Rebecca said and what Harper said, we need to be activists in our own lives and when we're called upon by organizations to call our legislators, call our policymakers, take affirmative steps to fight for our privacy and treat this right just like all the other really important rights uh, that we have fought for for so long. Harper. That's, 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 this is a lot to follow. Um, I mean, that Peter and Rebecca both said such, such great things. And um, so from my perspective, you know, I, I'm going to talk to the technologists kind of in the room and, and I'm just going to remind everyone that um, I think that we have a big problem with technologists building software and not really understanding how it will be used by its customers. Um, I'm pretty sure that Clearview didn't invent the algorithms that they're using to do facial recognition. Someone else did that. And that person um, is not in the conversation about how Clearview is, is problematic. And I think that that's something that we have to um, acknowledge that a lot of people who are building technology, that technology can then be, be taken and used against all of us. Um, and, and more importantly, it can really be used against our most vulnerable communities. Um, so I think it's really important for us to, especially as technologists, to think very carefully when we are building technology, um, can this be misused? And the answer is probably yes. And if the answer is yes, then how do we make sure it's not misused? How do we, and, and the answer might be, don't build it. But we really need to have that conversation. We need to have that conversation with ourselves. We, if you know technologists, you need to ask them, what happens if your technology is misused? What happens if the thing you're building is misused? Because I don't think that's a common conversation among tech, technologists, and it's very concerning. Thank you, Harper. And I would just say that at the ACLU, we're pretty lucky that we have an integrated advocacy approach where we're able to use our advocacy, legislation, litigation, communication, public education, engagement, in order to um, get the word out about protecting civil rights, civil liberties, and privacy. And um, those integrated adv advocacy conversations are now leading to thinking about more interdisciplinary conversations. Um, Sapna, my colleague and I, who've been, we've been working on contact tracing briefings for uh, decision makers, 
part of that work has led us to, to Harper and to really think through like what are the ways where we need to engage with the folks who are making the technology um, where we can learn from them and vice versa. So these um, parameters, these guardrails need to be in place. Um, if you want more information about our contact tracing work or you're interested in a briefing, please um, go to our website or email um, uh, I guess maybe the events at aclu-il.org. Uh, we really appreciate folks attending and staying for the whole time. Special thanks to Rebecca and Peter and Harper for taking the time to do this work with us. Um, a thank you to Jay, Jay our poll guru, and a special thanks to uh, Kayla and Emily from Philanthropy and Engagement for all of the work that went into putting this together. And I think we should leave with a little poll question. So what is the next privacy surveillance town hall issue that you would be interested in tuning into? So your options are drone surveillance, police use of technology, how data is collected by smart home devices, how to protect your privacy 101, and facial recognition. So before you sign off, please uh, vote. And thanks again, Harper, Rebecca, and Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.